So one of the largest tours in the last three years completely changed the business model and mindset of a number of people in the music industry. Now, it's still not widely caught on, largely because of artist ego. But one of the biggest tours of the last three years was Garth Brooks as he returned out of pseudo-retirement where he did a residency in Las Vegas and once again toured across the United States. But what was different about his approach, along with his wife, Trisha Yearwood, as they went out on the road together, was that they were perfectly fine performing to half-empty arenas. Now, normally, this would, this would absolutely destroy an artist and their fragile ego. And yet, Garth and Trisha had a different idea in mind. They would, they would announce a city that they were going to play in. And then the first show would sell out. And then they would add an additional show. And then that show would sell out. And they would keep adding concerts until the demand had been met. It completely ruined the scalping along with those shows as well as, as well as their approach to not allow you to transfer your tickets to anybody else. But what happened was they would just keep adding shows to guarantee that every person who wanted to go see them play was actually able to go see them play. As opposed to the regular business model of a concert where it's to have a small supply and to create as much demand as possible. And so you go to an arena and you lob off a third of the arena with your stage design and then you release a certain number of tickets to scalpers and then you release another set of tickets to the Ticketmaster bot scalpers and then a very small fraction of the tickets actually becomes available to the general public. And so most people People have to go through a scalper actually to get a good seat to see a show that they actually want to see. So this completely destroyed that model because in their mindset it was better to play to a half-empty arena during one of their shows to make sure that every single person who wanted to see them actually had the opportunity to take part in what they wanted to take part in. Now we're, in, we're wrapping up something next week called It's All About Love. And what we're doing is we're looking at three letters written by one of Jesus' best friends, a guy by the name of John. And what we've seen is, is, is a number of things. But one of the things that we've seen is that love will always win in the end. Love will always win in the end. And as people who've received love as a result of having a relationship with God through his son Jesus and what he accomplished on our behalf, as a result of, of having that relationship and having received love accordingly, we can live confidently. We can go through life with a level of confidence. We don't have to allow what everybody else thinks about us to determine our self-worth. But we can walk through life confidently, understanding not everybody's going to love us because, quite frankly, the world hated God. And so if the world hated the person we serve, we just have the expectation that there is going to be a segment of people who hate us as well. And so that doesn't determine how we look at ourselves and it doesn't determine how much value we see that we have as individuals. We also can walk through life confidently knowing we will experience challenges and we will experience hardships as we walk through life, but th those hardships don't define us either as a result of our relationship with Jesus. Make, following Jesus is what makes all of this possible. It makes understanding and receiving love possible. It makes knowing that what you say about me doesn't determine my self-worth possible. And what's crazy about this is this is available. This is available, this receiving love, this walking through life in confidence, this understanding that we can have peace with God in spite of the fact that we rebelled against him. All of this benefit is available to everyone who wants it. It's available to everyone who will merely accept it and take it. And so that's what we're going to see as we wrap up today the the book of 1st John and then next week we're going to look at 2nd and 3rd John together so if you have your Bible apps on your phones or your tablets you can take those out and follow along with us in 1st John 5 1 if not it'll be on the screen for you there but here there we find this everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him by this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, 
And so the first step of this is, is believing. We have to actually accept it. God loves us so much that he's given us the ability to choose. He's given us the ability to choose against him, but he's also given us the ability to choose to, choose to follow Jesus, to choose to have a relationship with God. But God in his love for us does not compel any individual. He's given us all the ability to choose for ourselves. He's given us free will to make the choice of whether or not that we want to follow God. And if we make the decision that we want to follow God, then the first step of that is belief that we would believe that Jesus is the Christ, that we have to understand who Jesus is and what he has done. And there are a number of people who have a number of conclusions about Jesus because you cannot look at history and, and argue whether or not Jesus existed. All right, the, the historical evidence for Jesus is overwhelming. And so the question is, what do you believe about Jesus? That's, that's what it all boils down to, is what do you believe about Jesus? And that's the question that every single person has to answer. Nobody can answer that question for you. Nobody can make a conclusion for you. It's up to you individually. You have to draw your own conclusions of who is Jesus. Your parents can't draw that conclusion for you. Your spouse can't draw that conclusion for you. It is up to you. Who is Jesus? So the step in following God, it starts with belief. And then this crazy thing happens, and there's this new birth. So we become brand new people as a result of following Jesus. It's crazy. And, and I just want to pause for a minute because there's, there's a lot of talk here about being born of God and, and this new birth, being, being born of him. And, and anybody who's had a baby, you understand just the, the exciting process that is, and yet also the terrifying process, and you understand that the kids, the, the awe and the wonder that they have when they're, they're first born, and then the, the terrors that they have. And, and so this isn't always clean. And, and sometimes we have the expectation when people say that they've become a follower of Jesus, that their lives are going to look one way, and then when their lives don't look that way, we're like, oh, well, that person doesn't get it, or they're, they're a hypocrite. And they, they might not get it, and they probably are a hypocrite, because Kind of, we all are on some level or another, but that's the beauty of following Jesus is we understand that we're not enough and we need grace. And so just understand that people who follow Jesus sometimes are really, really, really messy. And it doesn't mean that they don't love Jesus. It just means that there's some things that they have to work through. And there's a process that we all have to go through where we grow and where we mature. We understand that physically. All right? We understand that cognitively, and, and yet sometimes, for some reason, we don't always understand that spiritually when we're looking at other people, and we expect them to meet some sort of standard that they haven't yet met. And so we start to judge that person, just understand that this is a process, and it takes time. Or maybe it's not even an issue of judging another person. Maybe it's you judging yourself, because you love Jesus, and you know that you love Jesus, and yet there are still things in your life that you hate about your life. And you're like, I don't understand why I keep doing that. And if you're in that boat, then just understand that the guy that God used to write two-thirds of the New Testament by the name of Paul, he was in that boat right there with you. He said, the things that I do, I, I don't want to do all the time. So there's this battle and there's this struggle within you, and I want you to know that you're not alone in that. And I want you to know that your life is sometimes going to be messy, just as we understand looking at babies. Yeah, they're cute, and yeah, they're, they're a lot of fun, and they bring a lot of joy, but man, they can make a lot of noise, and they can be a mess sometimes. And that's okay, because we understand that. And, then, and speaking of babies, this is, this is just an aside, but, but I just want to I just want to give you a quick follow-up that we, we came here a few months ago and we said one of the things we love and we value at Lakeside is, is the next generation. And so we are going to do everything in our power to make sure that kids and teenagers have, have the best experience they could possibly have here at Lakeside. And we put just as much value in, in the children's and student ministries as we do what goes on in here on Sunday mornings. And we are starting a very long process of, what's, of what we're doing for our next generations. But I just want to let you know the first step of that has been implemented in the last week. We now have, uh, we now have five cribs and pack and plays and bassinets down there so that when babies come with their families, if their families want to, they can unload their babies there and the kids have a place to play, they have a place to sleep, they have a place to be comfortable. And that's possible because of your generosity. And when you give 
give to Lakeside, you enable things like that to happen. So thank you very much for enabling that and helping us. And that is just the start, I promise you. We're not going to be like, yeah, we got five cribs for the kids, so we're set. Oh, no. Buckle up, Lakeside. It's going to get fun. But thank you very much for that. I just wanted to, wanted to let you know that that is what's going on. So by this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and obey his commandments, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And so it starts with belief, and then we are born new, and we have a new family, we have a new name, we are now children of God. And the test for whether or not this is legit is this, that we love God and we love each other. That we love God and we love each other. If you want to know if you really follow Jesus, then here's the question you answer. Do you love God and do you love each other? Well, how do you know that? You obey his commandments. You obey his commandments. And it doesn't mean that it's 100% because it's never going to be 100%. We all fall. We all fall short. But here's the test. Here's the test for how you really know. Is when you do fall short, is it excuses or is it progress? Is, is, there, is there remorse? Do you feel bad? That's a good test. That's a good test. And so don't, don't allow yourself to become discouraged because you haven't reached perfection, but don't allow yourself to quit because you haven't reached perfection. All right. That's the test, that you love God and you love each other. And here's how you know, by your conduct. Your conduct reveals whether or not you follow Jesus. And his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? The commandments aren't burdensome. His commandments aren't heavy. And so what what can happen is we see all the things that, that... the Bible tells us to do, and all the things the Bible tells us not to do, and and we can think, oh, if I operate that way, it's going gonna, it's gonna to steal my joy, or if I operate that way, the, the standard is so heavy. It's just so much. My wife and I have a storage unit over in, in Green Bay. It's an indoor storage unit, and I was there a couple weeks ago because when we, when we moved here, we had everything organized, and then we had some other stuff on the truck that wouldn't fit into the apartment. And then we went back to the storage unit because I didn't want to turn the truck in a day later because it was an extra hundred dollars and I'm um, cheap. Uh, so I got to the storage unit at 11:30, and my in-laws met me there at 11:30 p.m. after driving all day, which was 12:30 a.m. Ohio time. God bless them. And and so they they met us there. And I, I tried to explain to them how everything was organized, but somehow at 12.30 in the morning, there was a little more urgency just to unload the truck and throw everything in the storage unit than there was to keep everything organized, which I understood. And I really appreciated that they came and, and helped me unload the truck while Brooke was able to put some stuff away and, and the boys were able to sleep at the apartment. Well, then a couple weeks ago, Brooke said, hey, I, I think we should get the Christmas stuff ready. I'm like, it's not December. And she's like, well, I I think we should get the Christmas stuff ready. And so I'm like, all right. So two hours later, reorganizing the storage unit, I had the Christmas stuff all ready to go, and it was organized. But while I was there, I was listening to a podcast, and, and I was just in my own world. And then these people next to me had a little trouble getting in their storage unit, so they asked which what key they had to use to unlock their lock, and I showed them what key that they had to use to unlock their lock, and then I I just heard them start to start to yell at each other a little bit, and it was over this box that was that was really heavy, and that they they felt like they they didn't want to move because what was in it was really heavy, and so I, I watched because I'm a people watcher, and it's really fun. And I watched as they were sitting there in this fight, and I'm like, well, this is fun. (laughs) And and then I watched the guy as his wife's sitting there yelling at him or very, very strongly directing him, whichever you prefer, point and tell him, this box is really heavy. And so I watch him. He bends his knees, and he braces for it. And he he puts all his weight on the legs, because you lift with the legs, not the back. And he, he goes around this box, and he, he counts to three out loud. I don't know why. Nobody was helping him lift the box. 
but he counts to three out loud. And he bends at his knees, and he lifts, and he completely wipes out because the box was empty. It was the wrong box. <laughs> Some of you, I heard like an O. Oh. Yeah. You and I do not share the same empathy genes. There was no O. Oh. I was cackling. <laughs> like, I couldn't, I couldn't even prevent, like, I didn't even try not to act like I didn't watch what had just happened. Be because it was one of the funniest things that I'd ever seen. And, and I just, I nearly started cack. Well, I didn't nearly start. I was. I was cackling. And I had to put my hand down because I, tears were starting to form in my eyes. Not out of concern for the gentleman. I, I honestly didn't care. I just thought it was, I just thought it was really funny to watch. But what can happen is we look, we look at all of the restrictions and all the things that God tells us not to do and the things that he tells us to do. And we build up in our minds that if we follow this plan, if we do our lives according to God's way for our lives, it's going to cost us so much. It's going to steal all our joy. It's going gonna, it's gonna to ruin all of our fun. And we brace ourselves for this impossible standard, not understanding that if we follow God's restrictions, if we follow God's guidelines, it's going to lead to more joy than we can even imagine. It's going to lead to more peace than we've ever experienced before. And we brace ourselves to lift this incredibly heavy thing. But it's incredibly light. And it will transform our lives for the better if we just understand what we're preparing to encounter. And he says, overcome, overcome the world. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And then we get to this lengthy portion. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God, that he was born concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed the testimony that God is born concerning his Son. And this is the testimony, that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Now, I understand that's a lot to cover, and there's some incredibly difficult concepts and themes in there, so let me just boil it down real simply to tell you this. When he's talking about the water and the blood, he's talking about Jesus. The water is his baptism, which started his earthly ministry. His blood fulfilled his ministry. His blood is when Jesus went to the cross and died on behalf of my sin and your sin, on behalf of my shortcomings and your shortcomings, when we all rebelled against God, and God still loved us anyway, so made a way that we could have a relationship with God. God and his standard of perfection, with none of us, which none of us meet. So he met it for us in the blood of Jesus because we don't measure up to his commandments. So the water started his ministry. The blood fulfilled his ministry. And not only that, but this is what God says about Jesus. That God looks out and he says, Jesus is the only path to me. God is testifying on earth his behalf about Jesus. And here's the crazy thing, that eternal life is available to us in spite of the fact that we rebelled against God, in spite of the fact that we rebelled against his commandments, in spite of the fact that God's standard is perfection, which none of us meet. We can still have hope. We can still experience love. We can have a relationship with our creator because of what Jesus has done for us. And this is what God says. This is the way to God. This is revealed to us by God himself. That this is the only path to God. And so we are incredibly, incredibly exclusive in that there is only one way to have a relationship with God. There is only one way to have a relationship with God. And the reason that we're exclusive in that is because God is exclusive in that. That it's it. There is one way to have a relationship with God. 
And that is through his son, Jesus. That's it. And yet, we're incredibly inclusive in that we love everyone. And we're cre- incredibly inclusive in that this is available to anyone who will accept it. And we're incredibly inclusive because God is incredibly inclusive. And in that it's available to anyone. And yet, the inclusivity is incredibly exclusive. And that there is but one way. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of Him. And so this relationship with God gives us confidence It gives us confidence that we can know for sure that we have a relationship with God. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. That we can be sure in spite of our shortcomings, in spite of our failures, God loves us anyway. So we don't have to walk through life in fear every step of the way. We don't have to worry every time we make a mistake. We can have confidence that we aren't enough, but Jesus is enough. And he is enough for us. And it starts with our belief and it leads to us becoming brand new. And then we can walk through life in confidence as a result of what Jesus has accomplished on our behalf. So we have confidence that we are accepted by God. But not only this, that God hears us when we pray. That when the worries of life come and they overtake our souls. When the trouble and hardship that we encounter rears its head once again. And we reach that point that none of us like to talk about, but we find ourselves overwhelmed. We find ourselves exhausted. We find ourselves questioning and just so unsure. We find ourselves in desperate need of guidance. We find ourselves in just desperate need. And here we are, and we cry out to God, and and we just ask we have the confidence to know that as followers of Jesus, that God not only hears our prayers, but answers them and provides us with everything we need. And so you might be at the point right now where you've been praying for something for a really long time. And you haven't gotten the answer that you thought that you should. And you're tired. And you've asked God, and you've asked God, and you've asked God, and you've asked God. And he's either answered in a way that's different than what you think it should be. Or it seems he's silent. Nowhere to be found. Not answering anything at all. And I just want to encourage you. Don't lose hope. Don't lose faith. And know that the God who loves you enough to save you not only hears your prayers, but will answer them. And it may not be in a way that you want. It may not be in a way that you desire. But he will provide for you everything you need. He's good. And if you need it, it might look incredibly different than you expected. If you need it, he will provide it. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death, there is a sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who has been born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. This week, many people found out something I have known for a long time, and it was finally realized. Vegetables are unsafe, and they will kill you. (laughs) There was a giant, a giant romaine lettuce recall this week. And this is, listen, this is the center of disease control, all right? This isn't just me. This is from the center of disease control. Romaine lettuce is unsafe to eat in any form. 
Let me read that again to you, because I'm, sure, I'm not sure it's sunk in. Romaine lettuce is unsafe to eat in any form, the CDC said, in response to a new outbreak of illnesses caused by a particular dangerous type of E. coli bacteria. The CDC told consumers to throw away any romaine lettuce they may have already purchased. Restaurants should not serve it, stores should not sell it, and people should not buy it. No matter where or when the lettuce was grown, it doesn't matter if it is chopped, whole head, or part of a mix. You know what the CDC has never had to rele release an alert about? Pizza. The CDC <laughs> has never had to come out. Never. They've never had to come out and say that pizza is unsafe to eat in any form. Why? Because pizza won't kill you. It's good for you. All right? This is proof. Lettuce will kill you. Don't eat the salad. Lettuce will kill you. Now, not every piece of lettuce is going to kill somebody. And yet, there is a very real danger here with this romaine lettuce E. coli outbreak. Here's the deal that John says. He says, all sin, all sin is unsafe. All sin is unsafe. It is all a violation against God. It is all rebellion against God. All sin is unsafe. So throw it away. Cut it out. Stop it. All of it is unsafe. But some of it, some of it will lead to an immediate death. Now, some of it will. Some of it won't. But that doesn't mean that you mess around with it. Because some of it will. So throw it all away. As followers of Jesus, we need to overcome the world. And just because we look at it and we think, well, nobody's going to know. And this really isn't going to hurt me all that much. We can toy around with it. And it's unsafe. And it might not kill you. In fact, it probably won't at first. But it will destroy you. And you are playing a losing game. So throw it all away. Treat sin like romaine lettuce. And get it out of your life. We know that we are from God. And the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. And so this, this is the test. Now, I am not a scientist, to say the least. I am not big on chemistry, because I never took chemistry, ever. I'm also apparently not big on opening Tupperware, <laughs> but we'll get there. Now, what we have up here, maybe. OK, this is sealed really good. All right. Now, what we have up here is water lemon juice, and bleach. And we have some pH strips here. Because apparently, in chemistry and other scientific things, it's not enough just to read labels on bottles. And so you have to do tests with liquids to understand the, the pH level of things. And so if you dip a pH strip in the water, it's neutral. It doesn't really do anything. If you dip a pH strip into lemon juice. You see it's very acidic. And if you dip a strip in bleach, you pray that none of it runs down your arm and ruins the little corner of your shirt. But you see it's a, it's a base. Very much. These strips, they reveal the truth about the liquid. Litmus tests are, are widely used in, in political discussions. They, they oftentimes talk about the litmus test. This is the test. This is what reveals the truth. 
Because things can be labeled one way. Things can say one thing. But when you actually dip the strip in, it reveals what's really there. It reveals the truth about the properties of what you're testing. Followers of Jesus, our litmus test is this, that we love God. And how is that revealed? That we follow him. That we obey his commands. And we love each other. That's the test that reveals whether or not We really follow Jesus. This is the test for all of us. Do we love God? Then we follow his commands. Do we love people? Then we treat them as ourselves. Because it's all about love. God, I pray that you would help us to be people who follow you. Not when it's easy. Not just in the good times, or not just in the hard times when it's hard. But that we would be incredibly consistent. God, I pray for the person here that's never made the decision to follow you. And I pray, God, that today would start their journey. That it would start with belief. That they would experience new birth. And starting their relationship with you. God, I pray that you'd help us love one another. To be intentional. Passionate. To love each other when it costs us something. God, I pray that each of us right now in the quietness of this moment would look at our hearts and we would run the litmus test right now in the quietness of this moment whether we love you as can be known by how we keep your commands and how we love each other. As can be known in how we treat one another.